can give me any audience, from senators to kindergartners, and it's not really fair to compare senators to kindergartners, to the kindergartners, right? Um, and turn them into bad defenders in the space of 10, 15 minutes. Well, this is exactly what we're going to do here with you, I hope. So here we go. The basics. There's more than 1,400 species of bats in the world. And they live in every ecosystem around the world except for the polar circles. They are here in the Azores. There is an endemic species of bat here in the Azores that some of you have seen, and I'm looking forward to seeing it today. Um, so there's, they're everywhere, really. But they have the greatest morphological and ecological diversity that you can possibly find in the world of mammals. For example, Mexico has 140 species of bats. This is just a collage of 12 of those species. And you here will find bats with enormous ears, bats with tiny ears, with long snouts, with short snouts, with big eyes, tiny eyes almost inside their ears. Each configuration comes with a particular natural history. There's really beautiful bats like that. That is a really, really pretty bat. But I have to tell you that there are some others that remind me of my uncle Roberto. <laughs> <coughs> OK, so let's go into the benefits that we get every day of our lives that bats provide for us and that make our lives better. Number one, pest control. Control of insect populations. Just in the northern fringe of Mexico, just before the border with the US, we estimate that we have about between 20 and 30 million bats of one species, that same Mexican free tail bat that Richard referred to earlier today. Each million bats destroys 10 tons of insects every night. Try to picture what 10 tons of insects look like. It's probably this auditorium full to the brim, or something like that. And that's what each million bats destroys each night. Much of the diet of these animals is composed of agricultural pests. Pests that eat from corn to rice to potatoes to coffee. So if you have been enjoying any of these things and hundreds more, every time you eat popcorn or nachos or tacos or risotto, or paella. Every time you dress with a cotton shirt, you are connected to the bats. Right there. Second one, seed dispersal. In the tropical countries of the world, there's a lot of species of fruits that depend on bats for their dispersal of the seeds. You go to the markets in those, in those countries, and you find an amazing array of these fruits and many, many more. We have those fruits because bats have been dispersing the seeds for millions of years. It doesn't stop there. Look at them there. Here they are traveling with a fruit in their mouth from the parent tree, and they're going to go to a perch some other place and then eat the flesh of that fruit and drop the seeds or defecate the seeds. Boom. Dispersal. We have shown that bats disperse between two to five seeds per square meter per night in the rainforests of the world. There's a particularly fascinating group of bats, the tent-making bats. The tent-making bats are so-called because what they do is they chew on the vegetation. They chew on big leaves, and they turn them into tents. So what you see there, 
this is the original shape of those leaves. But then you find these things. Next time you're in a rainforest in the new world, look for these things. And then look under them. And this is what you're going to find. The bats are under it, under an umbrella. Some of you have already told me that you have umbrellas in your home, etc., and the bats are living in there. Well, this is a pre-adaptation to doing this. But then you look under, and you see huge amounts of seeds all over the place. This is exactly what is driving the regeneration of rainforests, dry tropical forests, etc. Let's go into the next one, which is pollination. There's many ecologically or economically important species of plants that depend on bats for their pollination. You can see here uh, an array from bananas to big, giant saguaro cactus in the Sonoran Desert to durian, of course, in, the, in Southeast Asia, and many other plants. This is the sacred tree of the Maya, one of the most spectacular trees in the world, the ceiba. And the ceiba is pollinated by bats. The pollen is deep yellow. Look at this guy, completely covered with pollen, right? So part of these plants are associated with a particular product of my country that I'm particularly proud of, tequila. Why? Bats are the pollinators of the agave plants that are the source for tequila. But the tequila producers, the mezcal producers, have never allowed any plant to flower, to feed the bats, and therefore to have sexual reproduction in the plants and make sure that they are going to have a, a healthy population of agaves. So we started working with the industry about 10 years ago to create a program in which they allow 5% of the plants to flower, and then the bats come in, visit the flowers, and then the University of Mexico and the Tequila Interchange Project, which is a group of bartenders, producers, etc., give them this recognition on the label, on the bottle, bat friend. Let me show you uh, let me show you a little bit of what we do with these bats in the field. This is the, this is the Sonoran Desert, a very harsh environment, very hot environment. And that cave is the biggest cave that hosts the largest colony of this tequila bat. In this picture here, I want you to focus on the bellies of all of these bats. Look at that. They're all pregnant females that have been traveling for a thousand miles from central and southern Mexico. Only the females migrate. The males remain on the beaches of southern Mexico scratching their bellies. <laughs> and it's only the females that go all the way up there to take advantage of those columnar cacti that are flowering there. And that is our opportunity to monitor what's the population size there. What do we do for that? We use infrared video technology. So here, you will see the largest known colony of tequila bats in the world coming out. There you are. It's going to stay like that for four hours. Remember that they are all, at by this time, lactating females. They have their babies inside. I have to measure, to monitor, the reproductive success of the colony every year. But I cannot go into the, into the uh, cave during the day because I will create a major confusion among the females, and the females are going to drop their babies. So we have to wait until the last female comes out. Once the last female is out, then I safely go with a red light, and this is what I find. A carpet of babies on the roof of the cave. A carpet of babies. I want you to think for a second that you are one of those females that are going out to work and you're dropping your baby at daycare. Then you go out to work and you come back to this nature, na nightmare. Try to find your baby there. How are you going to find your baby? 
So this is part of the research that we've been doing in this video. Please focus on this baby here, the beginning of the video. The babies are nonchalant, they're just peacefully there, enjoying each other, stretching their wings, looking at each other, etc. Then two or three seconds into the video, this baby goes crazy. Like kind of our kids when we go and get them and they realize that we've come and get them, right? But when the baby is going crazy, you, ha you have not seen the female yet. A few seconds later, the female is going to show from this side, and then she's going to start sniffing and sniffing and sniffing each baby. But the baby knows that that's his mother. Here we go. He's going crazy. Mom, get me out of here. What are you doing? Why are you so late? And then she finally realizes that that is indeed her baby. She checks something. We're still finding out what is she checking. Look at the tongue. Flicking in and out the tongue. We don't know what she's doing. This is work in progress. And then she lets the baby latch onto the nipple. And then there they go. We have hours and hours and hours of this video uh, trying to figure out what's going on there. How is the baby knowing that the mother is back? And what's the mechanism that the mother is using to, to identify her own baby? So to end, let me just summarize that we owe much of our food of our clothing, of our beverage, and many more benefits to bats directly. No matter where you live, you owe it to bats. And unfortunately, nobody's thanking them. Nobody's taking them into account when it comes to environmental uh, management plans or conservation plans. Very few people take care of the bats. It's really high time that we recognize bats, we thank the bats, and we give them back a little bit of what they deserve for all so many things that they're doing for us. Please spread the message. Bats are indeed cool. And please get involved. As a final message, there's no evidence <laughs> that ties bats to COVID. No evidence. I'll be happy to talk to you after uh, after this uh, uh, session, if you're interested, for sure. And thank you very much.